I'm really excited and pleased to have uh, Dave Berman here. He traveled all the way from Bend today, which was very kind of him, and his family came with him. Um, and uh, just like Sister Ray, uh, David's had a lifetime, several lifetimes of uh, different experiences. And uh, I've had the chance to get to know him a little bit, and he's just one of those uh, one-of-a-kind folks that you want to hang around with a lot. Um, so, a Minneapolis city boy, Dave Berman, moved with his family to Lewiston, Idaho when he was in the sixth grade. There, he received, in the words of his Idaho uncle, a million dollar education. Mind you, it wasn't the traditional schooling experience that his parents wanted for him. Instead, he learned about riding horses, rodeos, racetracks, and roping steers. Reflecting back, Davis said, I was kind of skinny and not an athletic coordinated kid, but matched with a horse, I was equal to anyone. <laughs> As I said, he's lived several lifetimes of adventures, injuries, victories, and defeats, and much of it in Oregon, with stories and photos to back them all up. Hell, this guy even gave Haas Haas Cartwright, the ride of his lifetime. Maybe he might share that with us tonight. He's got a few days in jail. <laughs> I'd also like to add one more accolade to his resume. In my mind, Cowboy, po Cowboy Poet Laureate of Oregon. And here's one great passage from his writings about his own experiences that I wanted to read. I got to thinking I was a pretty good gallop boy, and I thought I was ready to gallop on the track. The Roundup Grounds in Lewiston had a small track and ran through the arena and behind the stock pens. Bruce Scott let me gallop a horse for him. The wind was blowing, and as we were passing the grandstand, <laughs> headed through the big gate that closed the far end of the arena, the gate moved, the horse moved sideways, and I stood hard on the stirrup. The stirrup leather broke, and down I came, knocking the air out of me. I knew the horse would be coming around again, so I started to crawl off the track. Louis Grove, the Roundup Grounds manager, jumped into the 49 Chevy Grounds pickup to drive out to pick me up, but didn't get stopped in time and drove right over the top of me. When they finally got me back to the barn, I was bleeding from splitting my head on a rock. Cliff just poured a little absorbian on the split, and after I ran around the barn about three laps, it quit stinging and bleeding. I never got infection or needed stitches. So please help me welcome Dave Berman. Quite a crowd. Oh yeah. Yeah, I uh, when I first Tim first asked me to come up here and talk a little bit, I was a little bit nervous, and then he he sent me that poster, and the ham and me took over. And <laughs> I said, "Well, I'll be famous just like my uncle. My uncle Dave was had his picture on a poster, but." It said $8,000 reward wanted for, and that was back in 1929, but that's another story. When I was a kid in Minneapolis, uh, we used to come up here, uh, up to Idaho on summer vacations to visit my mom's brother, my Uncle Tommy, and he always had a horse for us. Um, we we'll get there yet. <laughs> there it is. Uh, the first horse we had, now that shows my dad, my Uncle Tommy, Tommy's wife, 
My mom cut herself out of the picture, <laughs> but that horse's name is Old Paint, and four of us used to ride him bareback all over the place. He was so tall we couldn't get on him, so we'd put an apple on the ground and, and stand over his neck, and when he raised his head up, we'd slide down. <laughs> So uh, we'd go up there on summer vacations for a while, and then we finally moved up there uh, after I finished the sixth grade. So in the seventh and eighth grade, we, in the summertime, we'd go to junior rodeos, and that's where I kind of got interested in. But when I was rodeoing with my sister, our names were the same, so they used to run two barrel racers at a time, and if I beat my sister across the finish line, I'd get chewed out when I got home, so I got where I was setting up the horse a little bit, so I never won very much in the junior rodeos, but uh, I had a lot of fun. Um, actually, I first came to Oregon, it was between the eighth and ninth grade I decided I was going, well, like I say, when we were junior rodeoing around there, um, I thought my uncle taught me everything I needed to know about horses, but this, uh, this guy in Clarkston who gave riding lessons, he, he wanted uh, somebody to clean out his barn, and I thought, well, I'll make some money. So I went and cleaned out his barn, and he gave me riding lessons instead of money. But he always talked about his father-in-law who had a big ranch in Enterprise, Oregon. So uh, that summer I decided I was going to go up and I'd never met him. I just knew approximately where the ranch was and I knew his name. So I took off on, uh, on my horse and rode up to Enterprise and I wound up staying there the summer. And it was quite an experience, and, and it was many years later, after I'd gotten married and had six kids, that it was Truman Polson, who was the father-in-law, he was the one that got, got me my first thoroughbred horse and got me started uh, uh, at the race, well, kind of at the racetrack. Uh, both my youngest and second and youngest daughter uh, both kind of retired from Oregon jobs. Uh, well, Grace is semi-retired. She moved to Phoenix, so I guess she isn't an Oregonite anymore. <laughs> uh, Penny, when she was in high school, she both kids went through high school in uh, Warm Springs in uh, Central Oregon, and. She got interested in the grocery store business and she went to work for Grocery Outlet. Well, later on she got some, uh, a store of her own, but they didn't have an opening in Bend. And she kept wanting to come back to Bend, but she had a store in California. And I went down there and helped her a little bit when uh, her husband decided to get into the restaurant business, which didn't last too long. and. Uh, when it's time for me to come back to Oregon, she says, Dad, I want to uh, buy you a business to retire with. Well, about a month later, I went and visited my oldest daughter in Nevada, and I seen at the end of cul-de-sac five cottages, and one of them was for sale. So I called Penny up, and I says, Penny, I found a business you can buy for me, and you don't even have to change the name of the sign. Well, the sign read, Penny's House of Pleasure. <laughs> I'm still working. <laughs> oh, she told me to keep this speech clean, by the way. When she told me. <laughs> um, a little bit about rodeo, actually. Uh, Back in the mid-30s, the Rodeo Association was called the Turtle Association. Cowboys Turtle Association. And not too many people know that, but the reason they called it the Turtle Association, I've never seen a cowboy get too much in a hurry about anything. 
<laughs> and uh, then it became the, in the 40s, it became the RCA, which was Rodeo Cowboys Association. And then in about 1975, they started calling it the PRCA, Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association. I think RCA Electronics kind of gave them some static, and that's why they had to do that. <laughs> but back when, uh, when I first uh, got interested in rodeoing, uh, usually the stock contractor came in and, and provided the stock, and his wife was the secretary, and it was about a $30 entrance fee, and you went in the day before or two days before, and you paid your entrance fee and you entered, and then they actually drew the names of the stock and matched them up to the cowboys out of a hat. Nowadays, if you're not in the top uh, 50, you can't get to some of the rodeos, and you can turn out stock without having to have somebody take it out, and uh, of course there's a lot more money in it. Uh, when well, I was in the top 15 in bull riding. I was in the top 15 in the nation for three months one time, and I only made $3,600. <laughs> uh, I've actually been in Oregon since the mid-70s. Uh, I came to Oregon with racehorse and, and I wound up having the stables at Canada for from 19, about 1978 to 1986 and I've been here ever since. I went to, uh, well, in the ninth grade I used to sneak in behind the chutes at the Lewiston Roundup and I'd always, uh, the reason I picked bow riding uh, I was behind the chutes there and there was a Canadian bull rider named Hank Abbey. And this goes back to the time I rode that horse to, to Oregon. Uh, one morning I stopped and uh, did some chores to get my horse a feed of grain and me some breakfast. And, and the kid of the guy that owned the ranch, uh, I call him a kid, I was what, 14 or 12, and he was in his early 20s, but he was interested in Braden Rawhide, so that kind of got me interested in Braden. Well, then I, uh, when I got with Hank Abbey, he was braiding bull ropes, and in them days you could buy enough rope to make a bull rope for $2.35 and just, and uh, bareback rigging cost you then about $35 and the Bronx saddle cost $165. So I went with bull riding because I could afford it. <laughs> well, my, um, I, I went to a bunch of amateur rodeos and, and uh, uh, I went up to Joseph, Oregon and Joe Kelsey was the stock contractor and his wife was secretary, and you kind of, I was still in high school then, and you kind of wonder, uh, you know, well, should I go to pro rodeos because you, you figure the competition's going to be tough. Well, it was Joe Kelsey's wife that told me, if you go to a pro rodeo, they'll take care of you. They know how to handle the stock, and the stock's more ex experienced, and you're not going to get hurt. And then, besides that, old Joe Kelsey used to tell me, I like it when you come to my rodeos, you give my horses confidence. <laughs> so, I entered uh, Joseph Rodeo, it was my first professional rodeo, and I used to get up early and go down to the rodeo grounds and have breakfast with Louis Grove and his wife, So, and my dad never got up hardly before noon. But I went down there after the Joseph Rodeo, and the first thing Florence says to me is, did you see your picture in the paper? Well, there's a picture of me. Let's go, yeah, that picture. There's a picture of me in the Houston Tribune, and I heard back up home, but I was too late. My dad already saw it, and he chewed my butt out for about an hour. Next day, I went downtown, and, 
everybody now in the stores downtown come out and says, your dad's so proud of you, he's got that picture in his billfold. <laughs> so, uh, let's see here. Uh, Anyway, I, I, um, I wrote it a little more, and this was in the 10th and 11th grades. And, uh, oh, the first, I used to, like I say, go to a lot of junior rodeos, and I always had calf riding and cow riding, but my folks would never let me enter that. And this is how I got to know uh, Cliff Roberts. He, he got me in, in, introduced to the racetrack. And... Uh, so my Uncle Tommy took me to Cliff's place because he always kept a cow around to practice roping because he liked to head and heel. And he had, the cow had a couple of calves there. So they, they roped this calf and they, and of course I'd made my first bull rope. So they put me on them and they threw me off into the irrigation system. I broke both collarbones. <laughs> and, uh, that's when I really got the bug, but <laughs> I used to go down to the rodeo grounds and everybody, they always had a practice horse or two down there and all the, all the other guys, you know, I was, I was still uh, in my teens and the other guys were in their 20s and their dads were wanting them to get on stock and I was trying to get on stock and they'd never let me on and uh, the kids, they didn't want to get on, their hearts weren't very big. And, but anyway, that's how I kind of got uh, started rodeoing. Um, let's see what. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm I'm going to get carried away here. I know. <laughs> oh, I went to Cambridge, Idaho, and I I used to try to ride saddle grounds because that's the classic event of rodeo. And what I did was when, when we first moved to Idaho, my dad bought my sister and me and my cousin Susan form fitter saddles from Hamley's and had her names on the stirrup leather. Well, I took my sister's saddle and my cousin's saddle and Tommy knew a, a guy there at Hamley's and I drove from Lewiston to Pendleton and I traded them two saddles in and gave $50 and bought my first association Bronx saddle. <laughs> and then in them days that they sold new for $165, now they're about $2,000. And uh, anyway, um, I went to Cambridge and I was riding the saddle Bronx and I Somehow, I, I, I guess I had a cold or something, but anyway, I hung on to the buck rein and the horse threw me off and I, and of course when he, and he just jammed me into the ground while I just laid there and the guys I went up with, they come over and they started kicking a little dirt on me and finally the ambulance crew come out and they threw me in the back of the ambulance <laughs> and, and they just sat there and was going to watch the rest of the rodeo and... <laughs> And I went up there with the Wilsons, and they had five brothers that rodeoed. And their mother come to the ambulance and, and made, made them take me in to 15 miles to where the nearest clinic was, and they brought me around. And so they told me, uh, they told me that uh, I'd be lucky to ride again. And so I called my mom, I said, I caught a little cold and I'll be home in a couple of days, but then the doctor got on the phone. <laughs> so my mom come and got me and they took me up and they decided I needed to be, uh, I needed to be on Dilatin and phenobarbital and I was an epileptic then. So then my dad decided to send me back to the Fence to Ranch School, which they sent me to in the ninth grade, he, was, he wasn't too sure I was going to graduate anyway. He was afraid I was going to take off and go rodeo. So I went there, and while I was there, I talked uh, one of the gals into uh, her mother into paying my entrance fees at the uh, Tucson Rodeo. <laughs> and that summer when I come home, my dad had bought me a Volkswagen for graduation. 
they got my my sister a fancier car, <laughs> and uh, so I went up to the corner gas station. And I, I back then gas was only 19 cents a gallon, and I charged up five five gallon cans full of gas to get me to Phoenix because I wanted to go down there and I wanted. At that time, Freckles Brown was the bull riding champion, and Enoch Walker was the saddle bronc rider. And I talked this uh, gal's mother into paying my entrance fees, which was ninety dollars for all three riding events. And I made uh, I made enough money to pay her back, but then I didn't have enough money to get gas to come home. <laughs> and in them days, they had a payphone under the grandstand, you know. So I went to and I called my mom Colette, and I says, Mom, the judge says it'd be, 30, uh, be $50 or 30 days. And my mom says, I'll see you in about a month, and she hung up the phone. <laughs> so she did have kind of a sense of humor. I had to sell a pair of horse clippers to get home. Well, then... <laughs> I was, I was still 19 when I got home, and, and of course I graduated high school. And then, and I, um, my uncle used to help Cliff. Uh, he run a bar there in Lewiston, work nights. But Cliff would take his horses to the rodeo grounds on Christmas Day, and start training them to go to the track. And in them days, we'd go to Portland Meadows then Long Acres, and then Spokane. Well, um, I'll tell you one little story about Tommy. He, he'd always go out in the morning and he'd pony horses along. They had the back gate that opened up onto the river, and there's a big sandy area there. So he'd take the pony horse and he'd take horses down there and, and uh, pony them for exercise and bring them back, you know, and, and that's kind of how I got to meet Cliff. And uh, Cliff had some horses in box stalls, but then he had four or five horses in tie up stalls. And this one horse called Long Oats, he was really a nice disposition horse, nothing wrong with him. But when he'd finished eating his morning grain, he liked to step back to the end of the lead shank so his butt would be out in the alleyway of the barn. And back then, uh, Bill Wire run the uh, rodeo grounds, and Tommy come up from the river, and old Bill Wire had a buggy whip, and he was whipping this horse on the heels to get him to stand, you know, move up in the stall. And Tommy put the third bed horse away and tied up the pony horse. He went over to Wire and he turned him around, and uh, when he got mad, he he didn't blow up or anything, but he either whistle or start humming the tune. And he never said a word, he just humming. He broke that buggy whip up into about a hundred pieces and threw it on the ground, got another horse and headed down to the river. Well, about that time, Cliff drives into the rodeo grounds and Bill Wire goes up there and he says, Jesus Christ, he says, Tommy's in a bad mood this morning. And, and uh, so Cliff asked him what happened and he told him and he said, he said, oh, don't worry about Tommy until he gets poking you with that index finger and calling you Mr. Son of a Bitch. Then you better watch out. <laughs> so anyway, I got a... Uh, well, we used to, after we'd take care of the horses in the morning, about 11 o'clock, we'd always go over a block away to Curly's, and there was a beer joint with a grill, you know. They had hamburgers and they had breakfasts and... And we'd always eat there. Well, I got a job there, and pretty soon, well, I had to get a job. I had to pay my bar bill. <laughs> I was only 19, but you know, in in Idaho, you could drink beer when you was 20. But in high school, I was always the one they sent into the grocery store to buy the beers. So anyway. Uh, that year I was helping Cliff at the, at the uh, rodeo grounds and uh, he wanted me to go to Portland with him. And I didn't think I could leave because I didn't have my bar bill paid. So one morning we were sitting there and we always had a street roll and stuff and, and Cliff asked uh, 
I can't remember the name of the guy that owned the place. He was from Canada. He said, go get uh, Dave's tabs, and he paid all, all the tabs, so then I decided I had to go to Portland with him. <laughs> so I went to Portland, and it, it's kind of funny because he had a, uh, what's the name of uh, trailers that look like an airplane? Airstream. Air he had a little Airstream camper, or trailer, you know, and he had a horse trailer, and I'd never seen anything like it before, but it had three horses abreast, so it was a pretty wide trailer, and he had a ton truck, and he used to put three horses in straight, one horse sideways, so he'd had four horses in the truck and three horses in the trailer, and he'd hook, he'd hook this uh, trailer behind the truck, and then he'd hook the other horse trailer behind. So we, we was like a, we was like a one of them truck trailers for two trailers, you know. And I, like I say, I was only nineteen. He put me behind the wheel, and we <laughs> to leave Lewiston. You had to back then Lewiston Hill, and that was. A windy, steep hill. He told me to drive, so I drove. <laughs> but it, I've never seen another horse trailer like that. Anyway, we got to Portland, and he always parked his trailer about a block away from Portland Meadows, and I stayed in the tack room. Well, everybody always gets a little bit of the cough or the croup or something there, you know, rainy nights and and cold at night and damp all day and so I got a little bit of a sore throat and cold and he says well you go to the trailer tonight with us and sleep in the trailer so I said okay and it was my job to give the horses their morning grain and, and to have the pony horse saddled before Cliff got there well when I got over to the trailer he took a big old tablespoon full of pine tar put on the back of my tongue, and then he wrapped plastic around my neck, put fursin on it, wrapped plastic around it, and then put bandage around it to make a fursin sweat. I, I was sweating all night. Next morning I got up early and snuck off the track. I figured I better be cured. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, we, we had a lot of fun. He, he was always buying horses off the schooling list at, at Spokane at the end of the year. And he bought a horse this one year called High Grady. And he was like 17 hands tall. And um, I used to gallop him. And, and Cliff put a lead chink on him and, and would sit on the pony horse and, and, and let that Jip line out more and more as we, and so I'd make a bigger circle. Well, this, uh, oh, I know what I was, I forgot to tell you that, you know, at the track you have to wear a helmet on the track when you gallop, and uh, they want like $35 for them helmets then. So I went out and bought me a tin woodsman hat with a elastic chin strap. I thought it looked really neat. So I, I was wearing that, and this horse went to bucking with me, and that hat would go up like this and slam down on my head. And finally, that chin strap broke, and the hat flew off in front of me, and I flew off the horse, and I buried my chin in that tin hat, put a dent in the tin hat. Cliff was laughing so hard he couldn't help me at all. When we went, when we went to the track, he bought me a regular gallop. Uh, the first time, and, and I've written some uh, stories up. I've got a few copies if anybody's interested. And then if you, if I run out, I'll give you my email address, and I, or if you give me your email address, I can send them to you. But it's, uh, it's so anyway, I wound up, uh, what, what's kind of funny now, Cliff was the grandpa, Clint was his son. Clint stayed at home and ran the ranch until Cliff died. Well, then Clint went to uh, Portland and Seattle 
And then Tom got into the business, Clint's son, and Clint's, uh, Tom's younger than me, and uh, they were always at Seattle anyway for, oh, eight years there. They were trading off the training uh, championships, you know. And in 1957, Cliff was leading trainer at Portland Meadows, and Edna, they put all the horses in Cliff's wife's name, Edna, and she was the leading owner, money-wise, and the total they won was $2,500. <laughs> and then when Clint got up there, uh, he, he kind of was king of the claimers, you know, and they, of course, they run for a little more money. And then now Tom, Tom Stills, training horses. As a matter of fact, he, he'll be up here this summer that changed the meets around. And uh, he, he trains as an assistant trainer to Jerry Hollendorfer, who is a record holder. Uh, but of course, Jerry Hollendorfer had like 300 head of horses to run, you know. And of course, he doesn't do it all himself. He never, but uh, it, it's quite a generation there and, and uh, it's a lot of difference in in what they matter of fact uh, a couple of years ago they got a hold of a pretty good horse called sure do and they thought he was going to uh, make it to the Kentucky Derby well he did make it to a uh, million dollar race he ran fourth in it and uh, so that's a class of horse that Tom trains now. And when when I uh, when I first went with Cliff, he, he never let me gallop horses on track. He'd let me pony them and take them to the gate. Well, when we got to Spokane, I thought I could gallop. And they were getting a dollar ahead to gallop. <laughs> well, Cliff says, uh, I'll set some horses up for you to gallop. And he'd meet me at the gap I would I get off one horse and on another I got thirty two head one morning and that's in a couple of hours and after that I says I, I don't think I want to gallop anymore but he gave me the he gave me the thirty two dollars that was pretty good money back then. Uh, oh yeah I always I always thought that uh, on the back side you know you have. There's so many in industries that make money off of the racetrack. You have uh, the people that run the restaurant, you have the people that provide the feed and the bedding, you have the jocks agents, you have the uh, uh, valets for the jockeys, you have, and with the, uh, the way the of course, uh, jockeying, they really watch their weight and that, and they always have trouble there. So all the elements of a good soap opera is back there. I mean, it, it throw Dallas out of the... It, it, and I always wanted to write up a series and have that. Now, they did have, recent, a while back, they had Gary Stevens and, and Mike Smith and that on a reality thing, but it didn't show the whole... Thing. It was pretty well. Uh, it was pretty well for the show, and, and it didn't show how the. And there's a lot of good things that happen behind the scenes too. So, and I always wanted to do that. Uh, you want to run through some slides? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we got. Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that's me looking pretty good there in the next picture. Now. Over there on the grandstand is the high school band, and they drum for the eight seconds. Well, that horse threw me through that drum set. <laughs> and, of course, they had my address. Well, the school tried to bill me for the drum. <laughs> I said, no, you was taking your own risk sitting that drummer up there. <laughs> and that's... I, 
Yeah, I think I won that one. I looked pretty good there. <laughs> oh, that was taken at Lewiston. And that was the only time I could rodeo in my hometown rodeo because I was old enough to sign the release. <laughs> and uh, that, was, uh, that was another time at, at an amateur rodeo at Lewiston. And I don't... Uh, oh, yeah, this... Uh, this is at Dayton, and, and I wrote this bow for quite a ways out there, but the next picture will show you how I got off. How do you survive? <laughs> What's next? Oh, that's just the fact, this horse. I, I think I broke my ankle on that one when I got off, though. Oh, hey, that's Rick. That's my cousin. I used to get him in all kinds of trouble because he's a couple years younger than me, and I'd always, I'd always con his mom and hauling us someplace to a practice session and and get her to pay our entrance fees of the amateur rodeo. And somehow or other, he, I talked him into getting on a horse at Spalding, and they got a picture of him, and he hid it from his folks for a long time, but I think they forgave him now. <laughs> That's that's at an amateur rodeo, and that's the last rodeo I competed in at Ogden, Utah. And my oldest daughter, she was so mad at me, and so I decided to quit rodeo. And then that was just at an amateur place there in the Sultan. Oh, and this is my Uncle Tommy on Lum. I got a story in that about Lum. He, uh, he used to run that bar at, at uh, uh, the Golden Spur Bar. And Wally Halsey used to come in there. And back when they first got this horse, there was a drought in Texas, so they sent up a railroad car full of horses. So they bought a whole railroad car full of horses and uh, he came out of that and he'd been uh, raced he was I think about four or five then he's 23 in that picture there and Tommy owned him five or six different times during his life and when we moved up there my dad bought Lum from whoever had him and gave him to Tommy and then uh, uh, Tommy had him ever since, but but he was quite a horse. And there's an, uh, that's the last picture I have of Tommy and Lum together. Uh, Tommy passed away. Well, Lum passed away, and a week later Tommy passed away. So I always like to think that they met each other up there. And that's uh, Cliff's wife and me. The first year I worked for Cliff, so I still, I think, I think I'm, I might have just been out of high school then. And, and, oh, and then, this is about 10 years before, but that, that's Cliff here, and just to show you what he looked like. That's your cousin? That's my cousin there on the horse, and, and uh, Cliff's boy Kelly. Oh, when? Uh, no, we're okay. When when we were at uh, Seattle, they had this seventy-two ounce steak with all the trimmings, and if if you ate it all, you got it. <laughs> so, and I was I, uh, I was a skinny kid then. I used to only weigh one hundred twenty-five pounds. Uh, so, Cliff set me up for it, and I think Cleve. Uh, Cliff's son ate the 72 ounce steak once, and, and I think you had an hour and a half and you could make one or two trips to the bathroom. <laughs> so anyway, Cliff takes me off feet and water the night before, and he makes side bets with everybody at the trap. We made about $125. I ate it. <laughs> That's Cliff there. And then at, at uh, Portland here, just, they had the pancake house just around the corner from the track. And this was way back when, when it was pretty cheap to eat. 
Well, Cliff would always buy me breakfast. We went in there once and they had uh, eggs and ham and potatoes. No, eggs and ham. They didn't have potatoes, they had something else. And all the hot cakes you can eat for a buck and a quarter. So, uh, and, and I mean, they made the big hot cakes. So, uh, I ordered that, and Cliff says, well, bring them a dozen hot cakes to start out with. You know, they only <laughs> usually start out with three. So I ate all, all of that, and uh, got done with that, and Cliff says, well, bring them another, and bring all the sides with it. So then I ate the second dozen, and he was going to order me some more hot cakes. I said, just make it six this time. <laughs> so we ate that, and the next morning we went in there, and, and the waitress says, I'm sorry. She says, the cook says you can have anything except that hot cake special. <laughs> but, uh, and, and on, on this deal, uh, Oh, you were talking. Uh, when I was still uh, going to private school there in Tucson, it was during that time the um, Bonanza was big, and they had Lauren Green and Hoss Cartwright and Little Joe. Nobody liked Little Joe. He's kind of kind of a arrogance, <laughs> but. Uh, they all like Gene Aki because it used to be, let's go to one of them where it shows the cowboys in front of the shoes. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, keep going. There. See, all the cowboys used to line up, uh, be lined up along the fence. And oh, Gene Aki would come out there, and this is when he was older too. And sit with us, and we just pass the bottle back and forth. <laughs> and then he'd say, "All right, I, I'll be right back, guys. I got to get up and sing a song or two, but I'll be back." <laughs> and anyway, we uh, it was at uh, Tucson, and uh, Hush Cartwright had broken his shoulder, so he was sitting on a wagon with four horses hooked to it, and he had his arm in a sling. And, and the guy that was supposed to drive the four horses into the arena didn't show up. And I was kind of young and cocky, and I volunteered for the job. I'd never driven four horses before, but Tommy told me all about it, you know. Well, they opened that gate, and I went, yeah! And them horses took off like thoroughbreds. We made five rounds. I looked over at Cartwright, and he's white as a sheet, and I said, don't you bail off of this wagon and tip over for sure. <laughs> and he was actually shaking like this, and he uh, took two guys to get him off the wagon. He, he stood in front of the microphone, you know, and they had some talking back and forth, and I think uh, Lauren Green sung a song, I think, I can't remember. But he wouldn't get back on the wagon, he walked out of the arena. <laughs> But he was a really nice guy to talk to. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that was the first rodeo, or first uh, horse I ever uh, uh, took to the paddock for Cliff, and he won the race. And uh, here at Portland, he used to go up to the back gate. And the horse would go around the track that way to the paddock. Well, Cliff was always on the pony horse, and I handed him the lead chain. And as he took off, I was in between the two horses, you know. As he led the horse forward, he had a piece of straw in his tail, and I just reached up, I was going to get that straw out, and he hit me with both hind feet, knocked me into the guy behind me. I knocked him down into the mud. And I'm, I'm bent over and can't get my air, and Cliff reaches down, grabs me by the arm, throws me up behind him, and takes me to the paddock. And when I got back to the back room, I opened my shirt, and I had two hoof prints <laughs> on my chest. You, you could see the nail holes and everything. <laughs> <laughs> And then these are uh, 
Yeah, this is uh, this is a horse I had when I had the stables. Uh, Penny actually was the owner of the horse, and he ran second there at uh, at uh, Yakima. The next time, oh, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, is there a, a wind pitcher of Atlas in there? No. Well, go back to there. It is. This was the next time we went up to Yakima. That's Penny holding the horse, and uh, so Penny and I went up there, and my wife and Grace were supposed to stay at the stables. Well, I take the horse to the gate, and when you come back, you ride into the paddock there with your pony horse and wait for the horses to go around and it's all chain linked off and so here comes Beth and Gracie and the race has started and I says by the way I bet a hundred dollars across the board on that horse and he's dead last he's coming around the clubhouse turn and he wind up winning the race and I thought, I thought Beth was going to tear down that chain link fence to get to me. But you can, if you look at her face there in the wind picture, she's trying to figure out $100 across the board. I made more money betting on the horse than I won in winning the purse. But you can tell she's trying to figure out how much money I might have won. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, that's, oh. Yeah. You gotta tell this story. Oh, that was at the Salem at the State Fair. And I think I got mad at the guy that was going to jockey. And I crawled on the horse. And uh, that, uh, I, we ran second there. And when I got all done, the stewards took the purse away from me, the second place purse, because. I was 10 pounds overweight, <laughs> and I didn't have a jockey license. I had a gallop license, I didn't have a jockey license. <laughs> and those were just some, uh, second. Oh, uh, I won two races with this horse a week apart at Borisi. Now this guy, that's standing over here. He's the owner of the horse that ran second in the race. He says, I gotta get in the wind pitcher. So he got in my pitcher. <laughs> and you can tell Penny and Grace are pretty small there. You wanna take some questions or? Yeah, uh, oh. Uh, Talking about braiding, I do, I do, still do some braiding. I, I make belts and headstalls and reins if anybody's interested. And I got some cards and I got some of them stories. And if you if you'd be interested, uh, I only got a few of them stories. But I could, if you leave me your email address, I can send you them. They're kind of interesting to read. First of all, around. Anybody have questions? There in the back? Yeah. How many bones did you break when you were in the rodeo? How many didn't you break? Oh, what? I, I broke my leg when I was pretty young. I think in the eighth grade, and uh, they were always trying to get me to gain weight. Well, I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks, and then they finally put me in a wheelchair, and then they let me up on crutches, and my dad said he'd pay me a dollar a pound for every pound I gained, so I kept throwing fishing weights down in my cast, and when they cut the cast off, they ruined the saw. <laughs> oh, they, uh, 
uh, they ha at the races, they have a little, it's like a hot shot, only it fits in the palm of your hand, they call it a machine, and jockeys will use it to kind of give their horse a little boost. Illegally. During, Illegally. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's very illegal. Matter of fact, um, and I didn't realize it, when uh, Tommy was at Seattle, he, uh, he always used Vicki Aragon and helped her win the uh, title. And her brother, George Aragon, uh, a few years ago, got caught using one of these, and they revoked his license for 25 years. Well, he's a 30-year-old, 25 years, he won't be riding anymore. <laughs> but but uh, one time I was taking a horse to the gate there at Yakima, and uh, the jo uh, jockeys always want to know how their horse is going to react, so he had me dally him up pretty close, and he was going to try it and make Sometimes the horse would stop instead of moving ahead. And he couldn't get the thing to work. He said, this ain't working well. We go to go behind the gate and there, the, the uh, starters having all the jockeys dismount to frisk him, you know. So he hands me them, and I got my pant leg tucked in my boot, so I dropped it in my boot. And that some gun went off. <laughs> I, I'm taking my leg like this. And old Dennis says, well, we know where that one went. I had black marks on my ankle where that thing hit me. Other questions? You ever get into any bar fights? And if so, what about? Oh, just recently. <laughs> I got sticking up for this girl in the bar. And now I got false teeth, you know. And I get kind of loud and yakking, and my upper plate kept falling down. This guy got laughing so hard, he says, I was going to take him out in the parking lot. This guy got laughing so hard, he says, I can't take you out there. You can't even keep your teeth in your mouth. But yeah, I've been in a few bar fights. It was really good when I had my arm in the cast, because I could bang him over the head. I'd go into the... Uh, after the weekend, I'd go into the dock and have to get another layer of plaster put on my cast. <laughs> and he, yeah. Do they still have those races and those race tracks? Oh yeah. Uh, it's changed quite a little bit. Uh, Yakima Metals is shut down. Salem is down to just, I think, the fair meet. It used to run about 30 or 60 days. Um, Bay Meadows is a shopping mall, and so it, it's, it's really too bad, too, because when I mean, Sundowns over there at Tri Cities used to, I spent a year there once for two months. <laughs> it got pretty hot. Yeah, Portland, and now, like I say, they they have a summer meet, and then they go into their fall meet, uh, and there's so much now. You know, at Portland, you used to have the people come to the grandstand. Now the grandstand's empty, but they do the off-track betting, so that, and that's how the track makes money is on the handle that they handle. Uh, I just wish they had, uh, but it takes a lot of horses to make a meat go. When you figure you got uh, eight to ten horses in a race and you got ten races a day, it takes quite a few horses on the grounds to make it go. But Portland's barns, as a matter of fact, Tim and I are going over there tomorrow morning. Portland's barns has been laid out the same for ever since I started coming. That's quite, I'm getting pretty old now. That's quite a while back. There's a question over here to your right. Yeah. Yo, was there any special trick to make it through a four and a half pound steak? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Cliff, 
Clint had his pistol with him. <laughs> so if I didn't eat it all, that time it, he took me off feeding water though 24 hours before, well 12 hours before I went to eat. And he says, he says, just have it raw if you can, because it'll slide down easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's Cliff's last name? Roberts. It's Cliff Roberts, Clint Roberts, Tom Roberts. And uh, now, in case they ask you a trivia question, Tom Roberts was the last one to win the most uh, leading trainer at Golden Gate before Jerry Hollendorfer. <laughs> so if you ever get asked that question on the trivia show, you will have the answer. <laughs> What's the most you ever won at one rodeo? Uh, I won, I think about $480 at, uh, in one event. Yeah. That's back when the entrance fees were only thirty, thirty-five dollars. Now they're they get, and they have sponsors and the money's so good. Uh, if I had enough Jack Daniels in me, I think I'd go try it again. <laughs> I took Seattle Slough to the gate one time. I, I think it was for the Portland Mile. What was he like? He was an ornery. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, th let's see, there was another horse. I took Gary Stevens to the gate. Number. Well, I'm so old that I remember Gary Stevens looking for uh, horses to ride at, at uh, in Idaho, at small tracks. He's a Hall of Famer now? Yeah. He's, he was in uh, a couple of movies, and he was in that reality thing, Mike Smith. And <laughs> there was one, one kid, that, and he was a pretty good jockey. His name was Ron Hansen. And so he had a lot of mounts there, and you ride every race, you know, and I was ponying a lot of horses to the gate then, so I'd invariably pony him. And the first couple of races, he was pretty good, and the next couple, he'd start singing, and he sings worse than I do. And by the end of the race, uh, by the last race of the day, I don't think he knew whether he was a foot or a horseback. <laughs> but he sure could ride. Back there. Yeah. Could you tell us about the favorite buckle you've won? Or do you have a favorite buckle you've won? Well, a lot of barmaids have them buckles. <laughs> <laughs> I won, I won uh, four or five buckles. I think I think my youngest daughter stole the last buckle I, I won. She's got it. Um, I can't, let's see, I can't remember now. I won, uh, I won the bull riding at, uh, did I win at the, no, Tucson one year. And I split second and third. That year that I made $90 back, I, I split second and third in the bronc riding and, uh, I think there was a ground split on the bull riding, and I got thrown off my uh, uh, saddle bronc. So it was in the bareback riding. I, I either split fourth and fifth or something. I only won ninety dollars, and that was just enough money. Well, no, I think I won a little more than that, but I did booze it up a little. <laughs> I still didn't have any money to get drive back home. <laughs> any other questions? 
Did you ever compete in the Pendleton Roundup? A number of times before it got really big. Now they you got to be in the top 50 in order to even enter it. Oh, one, I got to tell you a story about Rick. <laughs> like I said, I got this Volkswagen when I graduated. So I had this Volkswagen and I'm parked behind the chutes at Pendleton. And Rick comes over to see me. Well, I overtrained a little bit the night before and I got my feet out one door and my head out the other. And they're calling for me. They got my horse in the chutes. I said, Rick, you always wanted to ride. I said, go over there. Get on that horse for me. I had them all saddled and everything. So he got on the horse and they got his picture in the paper, but they put my name under it. <laughs> um, I think he got thrilled up. Uh, can we go to that one picture again of Rick? Which one? Oh, yeah. Wild Louie. I got to see where that was. There? No. There. That, that's one of the times I got, oh, we went to Chief Joseph Days one day, or one weekend, and I was supposed to, you know, he's a couple years younger than me, I was supposed to be watching him. So uh, they always had a carnival around. And I'm waiting in line here trying to smooth talk a couple of gals, and Rick disappears. Well, about, and I, we were sleeping in, in the, behind the chutes, you know, and sleeping bags and that. So I'm sleeping, uh, and he never did show up. The next day they have a parade, you know, and here comes a white Cadillac with the queen and two princesses, and he's sitting right amongst them, stringing the rope with a big old 10-gallon hat on. I said, well, he lucked out better than I did. I had to sleep on the ground last night. Any, any last words, Dave? Oh, one, uh, I'll, Go ahead. if you don't mind, I'll tell you one more short story. <laughs> we used to uh, come up to Enterprise for a junior rodeo, and they had the Enterprise Hotel, which was three stories. And uh, so we had room there at the hotel. Well, about seven of us trying to crowd in there. <laughs> and the guy got kind of mad at us, and I, I had just, well, <laughs> I mouthed off to him, and he picked me up and threw me out the window. <laughs> and it, it's no, and they had awnings over the windows on the first floor. And if I wouldn't have hit one of them awnings, I would have went splat. But I bounced off the awning and bounced out enough and hit the roof of a car, and that's the only thing that kept me alive. <laughs> Anything else? It's been nice having you.